um, Azure Data Factory and Azure Synapse pipelines change data capture. So um, the reason why I'm saying both Azure Data Factory and Azure Synapse pipelines is that within Azure Synapse workspaces, the pipelines and the data flows that you see in there are actually Data Factory. So Data Factory has pipelines and has data flows for um, low-code data transformation and for ETL jobs. And what Synapse, the Synapse team did was they took what we've done in Data Factory and they uh, included that in uh, Synapse Workspace when you, set up, when you spin up a Synapse. And um, so for the most part, most of the things that we build in Data Factory um, flow into Azure Synapse as well. So what I'm going to show you today will work in either. Uh, there's not going to be a difference between the two. The differences between the two um, I'll call out as we go through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a, a real brief intro uh, to Data Factory just into Microsoft Data Integration all up within um, Microsoft just so that you understand a little bit about it if you're not all that familiar with it. And if you're not really familiar with Data Factory or Synapse Pipelines, the, the hands-on stuff I'm going to do might go a little fast for you, um, but I'll definitely point you to some videos and some tutorials online that'll help you um, and you can work your way through these things at your own pace. So the first thing I want to do is I want you to be aware of Microsoft data integration all up in the product portfolio there. Um, today we're going to focus on Data Factory and Synapse Pipelines, but there's also um, SQL Server Integration Services and Power Query are all part of the same team here that I'm on, uh, the product team within Microsoft. And so you're going to see a lot of uh, more consolidation and um, uh, completeness of vision around these different ways to in integrate data and build ETL jobs within Microsoft. It's a really exciting time to uh, to work at Microsoft and to buy into these uh, different technologies that we have uh, around data integration. And um, if you're not already familiar with Data Factory, uh, this is actually available on our website on the uh, introduction documentation page for the Data Factory documentation, which is this is everything that you can do with Data Factory in a single uh, pane of glass, to be honest with you. Um, and there's a lot of terminologies in here, but it, it walks you through building a factory to um, understanding how to add activities, how to build connections to your data stores through your link services, how to define the data through data sets, um, set up your compete with integration and runtimes and so on and so forth. So rather than me walking through all this, I will just point you to this and, and it's a great place to start if you're new to Data Factory and the link for the doc is up there at the top of the slide. Now, when we talk about CDC and how we're going to do change data capture with Data Factory, um, it plays into this larger sort of reference architecture that you build for building big data analytics in the cloud within Microsoft, you know, within Azure. And uh, Data Factory for this sort of a common architecture is going to be your orchestration, monitoring, uh, your data transformation, and your workflow tool. And from a workflow tool perspective, you don't have to uh, do all of your data, all of your data movement and data transformation inside of data factory facilities. The data factory comes with the copy activity for data movement at scale and and data flows for data transformation at scale. But there are a lot of our customers that transform data through, you know, other sources like um, HDI or Databricks or Synapse Spark, um, you know, T-SQL with um, SQL Server. Um, so that's very common as well. So all that is fully supported and is all part of the monitoring um, and CI/CD within Data Factory. CI/CD being built in to Data Factory as well. I probably won't get a chance to talk too much about CI/CD in this uh, in this meeting, but we can always have a follow up if you'd like to talk more about that. I'm happy to come back with you all and do that. So when you think about the pipelines that we're going to build today, um, the pipeline itself is the primary. Uh, I just realized there's a typo. I have an equal sign there instead of a dash for browser based. Um, this is. Um, the uh, um, uh, the general uh, the, the the baseline for everything you do in data factory is going to be based on a pipeline. The pipeline inside of your factory, your factory is really your account within Azure Data Factory. The pipeline is a primary unit of work that's going to orchestrate and execute everything that you do, including data flows, which we're going to work with quite a bit today for the change data capture. And then we're going to be in this uh, design area quite a bit today, which is building ETL jobs that are uh, enabled with CDC to transform uh, data at scale. When you when we work within uh, the code free data flows within Data Factory, we're going to be executing everything um, in Spark. 
and you don't need to know anything about Spark, we'll just, we'll just do that for you, and we'll manage the clusters for you as well, and it's all at scale. And then the Power Query part that I mentioned earlier comes into play with Data Factory through the Power Query activity. Let's give you that Excel-like interface um, and the ability to uh, essentially have a, a data wrangling experience built directly into Data Factory that's going to execute those uh, data wrangling activities at scale. Um, we will, I will show you the monitoring today as well when we do the CDC jobs. The monitoring is very important to be able to have an effective ETL um, infrastructure uh, within your business. Uh, it, it's very difficult to build and maintain a uh, large scale first class ETL data analytics platform without having a monitoring, a rich monitoring experience with your ETL jobs. And uh, within Data Factory, you'll get all of that. You'll get your success, your failures, um, the stats about each run, the ability to rerun from this view and all that. So we'll see some of that in just a bit. Uh, now, we're not going to talk about this today, but this is the ability for you to add activities into your pipeline so that you can work with your data through other means, uh, such as Azure Functions. I might already mention Databricks and Synapse Spark, HDI, SQL, um, and whatnot. All part of the pipeline capability within Data Factory. Now, I do not want to have you all leave the session without at least hearing this, is that if you have SSIS today, um, and you want to move into the cloud, you can use Data Factory to do that. We allow you to lift and shift your SSIS packages directly into the cloud using Data Factory. We have a integration um, runtime type that is known as an SSIS runtime, and we will manage the SSIS compute for you. We'll spin up the VMs. You can choose the size of those. Uh, you can stop and start them when you're not running your ETL jobs in SSIS. In fact, when you actually do this and you lift these into the cloud, you really just take your existing SSIS packages and you redeploy them into uh, the cloud. And then you can build a pipeline that has all the other activities of the of the Azure based data factory with the ability to call your existing SSIS packages using the execute SSIS package activity. So it creates a very interesting kind of hybrid sort of um, ETL uh, process for you. It's very good if you're new to the cloud, new to Azure. All right, that gives you the flyover of Data Factory. Um, if you're new to it, I didn't give you much detail, but I at least wanted you to know the uh, the extent of what we do. And there's a lot more to it, but that's a pretty good chunk of what we do. What we're going to talk today about is using the change data capture uh, capability. And what is change data capture? Right, change data capture is the ability to take data from your sources and not have to reprocess the entire data set every time. Um, the ability to um, uh, only bring in the rows or the data that has changed, that has been updated, deleted, inserted, uh, and then process those throughout your data flow. Very, very valuable, especially when working with big data. You don't want to have to do a full load every time. Um, now, the way we've implemented this in Data Factory is on a connector by connector basis. So what that means is the, the set that I'm showing you on the left-hand side of the slide is the um, available connectors today with CDC enabled. So it's SAP, uh, Azure SQL database, um, and SQL Server, CDM, Postgres, uh, Blob Store, ADLS Gen 2, MySQL, and Cosmos DB. Now, not all sources are going to be CDC enabled in Data Factory because we have to write the logic and part of the driver to be able to know how to pull changes from those sources. And it's going to be implemented slightly, slightly differently using our same um, infrastructure, but the drivers have to be different because we have to know the uh, the complexities of the sources for this to work. So we're, we're doing this on a very deliberate connector by connector basis. And you're going to see that it's very super simple to enable CDC. You don't need to be any kind of a da database expert, or you don't even need to know anything really massively about the sources. There's a series of three checkboxes, the incremental extracts, the change data capture and read all files on initial load. I'm going to save that for now. We'll talk about that more in a bit. But on the right hand side, when you move that data and you get those changes, you can land that in any one of our 100 plus connectors. The data factory comes with all these connectors pre built that you don't need to purchase or buy or anything like that. They just come as part of the service. And we iterate on these every month. We add more connectors all the time. 
with the data factory. You don't need to do anything special to get new connectors. They just show up in the service and they will be available to you as data sets and link services. So some of the abilities that you're going to get, um, it's easy to enable. Um, you can use your existing pipeline and data flow logic. You don't need to change it. You just enable those checkboxes. You have the uh, option to read from the beginning or only read changes. So it's you know a good idea to have that read from beginning checkbox checked when you first run your pipeline so that you get all the data. You may not always want that. Sometimes you'll just, you may just want to start from that point in time, um, in which case don't use the read from beginning option. We'll read only changes. The the checkpoint is automatically maintained by EDF. You don't you don't see it. You don't need to worry about it. Um, but if you like, you can always at any point reset that checkpoint and start over again in that uh, that change data trail. Now there are um, is there two? No, there's just one other. There is one other area that I want to talk about. I'm only going to briefly touch on that today. And this was uh, a new announcement that we made a build the build conference recently, which is uh, enabling SQL replication to Synapse as part of Synapse. So this is all built on data factory technology. And this is, again is only um, reading, detecting changes from your sources. This is actually replication. Though. So what we're going to talk about today is an ETL job that uses change data capture to only get changes from your sources. Replication is keeping the transactional systems um, essentially aligned uh, but what we've built for what's called Synapse Link for SQL, what we've built for that is the ability to take uh, your SQL Server sources and put those into Synapse. And so it's very simple to configure, and I, I should have a, enough time to show you that today. It's essentially what's known as sometimes HTAP, or how um, Synapse could take the changes from your OLTP systems and give you the analytical view without needing to write ETL. You, you can just set up this, this replication job through Synapse Link and get uh, the needed results. There's also two other types of Synapse Links. I listed them at the bottom here, uh, Synapse Link for Dataverse and Synapse Link for Cosmos DB. So Cosmos DB, by the way, works really, really well with EDF, and especially in these replication change data scenarios because there was a, a change feed feature that is part of Cosmos DB. And the more that a um, source has support for CDC, the easier it is to enable and work with and the more richer that it is within ADF. In fact, if you look at the list of connectors uh, that are working with CDC today, you'll see things like SAP and SQL um, and Postgres and, and MySQL. And that's really because there's a lot of CDC capabilities in those sources. All right, so that's what we're going to uh, go through today. That's all I had in terms of setup. I'm going to switch over into my browser in my data factory. We're going to build from scratch a couple of things. And like I said, if you're unfamiliar with ADF or not too familiar with building data flow ETL jobs, uh, this may be new to you and it may go a little fast. I'll try to explain things as slowly as I can, but um, at the end of the day, um, we'll give you some links that you can watch videos uh, with more detail in it and uh, some tutorials to help you through it. And I'm just going to uh, stop sharing for a second so I can switch screens. While I'm do that, while I I'm doing that, you know, feel free to you know raise your hand or just go ahead and unmute and ask any questions you have about Data Factory before I get to heads down on the uh, the demonstration. Yes, yes, um, Mark. Um, Mark. Um, um. Yeah. Can you, can you hear him? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sure. What sure. What hearing hearing for. for. But anyway, I think you didn't intro yourself. You didn't give an introduction. Oh my gosh, I didn't, did I? <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Mark. Uh, so I'm a program manager on the Azure Data Factory team. I've uh, I've been with Data Factory now for over five years. Uh, Microsoft for twelve years, and um, I've been in the ETL and data integration space for about. 20 years, um, very long time. And um, uh, yes, yeah, so that's me. And, um, you know, I, I've been always in the data analytics space. And, uh, you know, we just do some really exciting things in the Azure Data data team. It's, it's great to be a part of, and I, I love coming here to share this stuff with you all. Thank you. All right. All right, let's do this. Let's kind of go into some examples. Now, I have some pre baked examples. I'm going to save those in case I mess something up or we want to, uh, or maybe the end result that we do is build from scratch doesn't look the way we want to. We can always go back to some of the pre-canned um, 
demos that I have. Let's start with something new. So whenever you want to start a new project within Data Factory, I almost always start from a pipeline. That's more of a preference kind of thing, because like I said earlier, is that the pipeline is your basic unit of work. Within Data Factory, you can't really do things. You can do a few things, but you're not really going to accomplish very much without a pipeline. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say new pipeline. Let me just do a pipeline. I'm not going to use a pipeline from a template. You know, I will show you something though, is that before we do, I do want to show you the template gallery, very, very important part of um, of Data Factory. And if I look at, um, for example, I was talking about SAP, we have a lot of templates to be able to pull uh, change data uh, from SAP. In fact, we have a whole knowledge center around uh, grabbing change data from SAP. And when you make these templates, I don't have an SAP connection, so this isn't going to work, um, but you'll see how easy it is to instantiate a template. Um, it'll give you the pipeline. The data flow is going to do all the CDC copy for you, so it's already set up for you. You don't need to build it. All you have to do is just point with link services, point to the connections for your SAP systems, and this will work. This will work against HANA, um, BW, um, uh, the uh, the um, all the different modules they have around you know CRM and HR and whatnot. Um, so it works for all those things because I, there's a common protocol called ODP that SAP uses. Sorry, Mark, there is a question. Yeah. Uh, exactly the same one you're talking about. So if you can take that. It is. Um, um, so whatever your there, there's a I don't know SAP well enough to talk really too intelligently about it. There is a, a protocol SAP uses called ODP, and I believe there's something you have to set up. I don't know if it's called SLT or something along those lines, but you do have to set up something on the SAP side that will capture those changes and then we read from that. We pull from that, so we'll work against uh, HANA, uh, BW, um, all the different um, uh, sort of you know CRM ERP modules that they have. Will work um, with that, and it's all documented in the Knowledge Center. You can get more detail on it from there, probably better than I can give you. Uh, but we made that pretty generic, so it'll work across the board with different SAP um, products. And that's why we call the connector as SAP CDC instead of uh, having one for each individual thing, because on our connectors list, you will see connectors for the individual SAP components. Mm -hmm. And you see that, by the way, when you go over here on the factory resources, the connectors I was showing you are listed under data sets. And if I say new data set, you'll see the whole list of those 100 plus connectors there. And if you look at SAP, you will see ECC, uh, ECC, BW, and there's the CDC, the brand new one that's preview. Notice that's not broken out by protocol or it's not broken out by um, by uh, essentially SAP product because that can collect anything that is uh, changed from an SAP source. But we're not going to demo that today. I'm going to demo for you instead um, Azure SQL database and um, uh, files that are changing using ADLS Gen 2. So uh, let's start with, like I said, I like to start with a new uh, pipeline. So you can use the template gallery. It was very helpful to get started instead of building from scratch. I'm going to build from scratch, though, and so I'm going to say new pipeline. So essentially what you get is a blank design surface, and from there is where you add your activities. And these are the different things that I was mentioning earlier where you can do things like you can um, move and transform through copy data activity, through data flows. You can also use um, resources that are compute resources like Azure Functions, Databricks, um, Synapse Spark on the Synapse side. So I keep mentioning Synapse, by the way, and I do have a Synapse. Um, actually, I'm going to use a different screen for that. Let me use this one. Um, I do have a Synapse workspace open here. This is Synapse. And you'll see that everything looks very, very much the same. It's just categorized differently. There is a pipelines category in Synapse. And the data flows are separated. They're actually under develop. So when you go to new uh, under develop, you'll see data flows sitting right there. That's the EDF data flows there. And data factor, everything is all you know consolidated into one UI. It's just a little different because Synapse has a lot more stuff in it. All right, let me go back to the browser screen, which should be this one. Oh, it is the one. Yeah, that's right. There we go. So we're on a new pipeline. Let me just give this a name uh, for this demo, and we'll call this um, CDC.
And of course, my whole screen is not visible. Ah, that looks terrible. This is, uh, you need to work on it, Mark. I, it also happened to me yesterday or day before yesterday. I was you know, presenting and then. <laughs> yeah. So I have my Git hooked up, by the way. So you'll see that I'm using GitHub. Uh, as I'm connected to. I, I highly recommend anytime you're working in Data Factory or Synapse for that matter, hook up your GitHub because if you don't, um, what ha I might have it that way on this one. Let me see. If you're not hooked up to Git, yeah, this, this one is an example of a Data Factory that's not hooked up to Git. And you'll see that it shows up here as Data Factory versus um, a repo. There is no save button when you are not hooked up to a Git repo. Everything has to be validated and published. So you get no sandbox area. Here in my in this version of my Data Factory, I'm hooked up to my Git, which means I get save. And then when I'm done saving, I can uh, merge into a collaborative branch and then publish. And it's a much more, um, it's, it's a much better environment to work in. So I, I saved this with just the name. And what we're going to do is to use CDC. I'm going to just drop a data flow on here, uh, drop it onto my design surface. And I, everything is just really slow on my laptop. I, I have like way too much running. Um, there we go. So let's call this data flow. The first thing we're going to do is let's do um, CDC from files. So I'll call this activity as a CDC from files. Okay, now under settings is where you can set the size of the compute that you want to provide for the data flow that you want to run. Uh, you can set it here in terms of compute type, general purpose memory optimized, general purpose is generally fine for most of your workloads. And I don't recommend very, very high core counts. You can go all the way up to, I think, 272 cores. But you know, typically, 8 cores, 16 cores is fine. I'm going to just leave this default at 4. If you'd like, you could also use the integration of runtime. Um, the integration of runtime will let you do things like set a TTL so that the cluster stays alive for a certain point, uh, period of time. In fact, I'm going to do that. I'm going to use my Dataflow um, IR with reuse, I called it here. And so you see those options go away because within that integration runtime, I'll show you the integration runtime. You go over to manage, and you can see your integration runtimes there. And um, this is the one I'm using right here. So if I click on it, you'll see under the data flow runtime that I'm using 32 total cores and memory optimized. I'm just kind of using probably too much. I don't really need that much. And I have a TTL of four hours. That's I, that's way too much. I don't recommend that. I set that for myself just because, number one, I'm internal to Microsoft, so I'm not worried about the cost, but also because I uh, run demos throughout the day. And so having this always available is uh, very important or very helpful to me. However, I did not do a demo yet today, so some of this is going to be starting up cold, and then it'll be warm and we'll stick around for those full four hours so that the performance after that will be even better. So I do recommend a TTL, but I recommend a small TTL, like around 10 minutes for uh, your integration runtimes. All right, so we have a data flow activity on pipeline, but it's not doing anything, right? It's not pointing to any data flow at all. So we can go ahead and create a new one. Now, when you create a new data flow, you're going to go into a different design surface, and this is going to be more of a design surface that is uh, really meant for um, really meant for building your uh, low code data transformation, which means more of a, um, a logical flow of flow of data, right? Data flow. It's a logical way that you want to process and transform data. So you always start with the source. And I said that I was going to show you how to um, build a CDC ETL job from storage. OK, so I clicked on source and I got a new source. Now the source is not pointing to anything. I'm going to use a data set to point to my data. I already have a data set that's called uh, CDC movies. This is a movies database from IMDb. Um, and with ratings, rankings in it, and it's called CDC Movies. So I'm going to open that uh, data set just to show it to you. Okay, it's pointing to my uh, data lake uh, storage, so it's ADLS Gen 2, and this is the file path that I'm reading from. I'm going to actually turn on my um, AZ mask so that GUIDs and stuff will get hidden, but I can show you my um, blob store. Which is interesting. I actually want to do, let me delete this file here. 
not blob store, but this is my ADLS Gen 2. It, the terms just kind of used interchangeably. So here is the source file we're going to read from, the source folder. The source folder is called um, CDC. Yeah, CDC. And it has no file specified, so it's going to read um, every file from that folder. Basically, what this is going to do. This is going to read from the folder called CDC in the container my container. OK, that's this is a data set and this is the link service. The link service defines the connection to that data store, which in this case is my um, ADLS Gen 2. OK, so back to the pipeline, back to the data flow. Great, so now um, I can actually look at what the data uh, looks like. Now I do not have, um, and by the way, the inspect tab down here on the source, the inspect tab will tell you what the metadata looks like for the um, um, for that source data. So you can see I have a series of six columns and they're all string because it's a CSV file. So there is no data type to it. But Data Factory, if you click on projection, can automatically detect the data types for you. And you can also preview the data and look at the data as it changes throughout your, your data flow. The only thing you need to do is you need to have your data flow debug session turned on. This will actually start a Spark cluster for you that will let you um, work with that data. And so I'm going to start that up. And the reason why it's not always running is because there is a cost associated with that. Um, it's about 25 cents per core per hour. Uh, and this is a small, the, the debug is just a four core worker and a four core um, uh, primary node, head node. And uh, so it's just eight cores. OK, so that's started. Now, the first time you preview data, it might take a minute for all the data to get read, all the drivers to be loaded and whatnot. So I'm going to let that cook for just a minute. What I'm going to show you is um, under source options, when you add a new source into Data Factory, you are always going to be reading the full set of data. But we don't want to do that in this case. We only want to get the change data. So I'm going to say enable change data capture. And I'm going to get the option to read all files on initial load. And that's what I want to do, right? I haven't run this yet, so I want to make sure I get all the files found in that folder. Now, my folder, if you recall, only has one file in it, which is movies.csv. Let me open that up for you. Excuse me, there you go. I think it's about 9,000 rows in it, not just a few columns. Let's take a look at the data preview. The data preview is going to only sample that data. You can set the sampling size for your data preview under debug settings. And the default row limit is 1,000 rows will be sampled from that source. And so you're, you're seeing a snapshot of that 1,000 rows that are sitting in memory in the data frames of that Spark cluster right now. And notice that I got a Spark cluster and I'm interacting with my Spark cluster without knowing Spark at all. I don't have to manage it or know anything at all about it. OK, so that's what my data looks like. Now I can, I can also, pre I can also um, profile this data. So let's say I want to look at that year column I want to get some uh, stats about that, uh, about that column. And the one thing to do is I just need to refresh this because I did change that at that time. Um, let me just refresh this. When you click on the statistics button per column, you can get um, profile details about that column. So if you click on statistics, what data factor will do is go and run a query against the source and we'll tell you things like what is the value distribution across that data? And this little um, button over here, the expand button, will let you see that in full screen. Uh, it'll take up the full space within the um, within ADF then. And so you see the, the distribution of the data across all the different values within um, your data. And then you notice how these are still all strings. So what I want to do is I want to set the data types for this. And I'm not going to set it manually. I'm going to go to projection. I'm going to ask Data Factory to do that for me. I'm going to say detect data types. Now what Data Factory is going to do is going to run that sampling again. And this time it's going to uh, take a guess at the um, data types for those. And it came back with the movie being integer and a couple of shorts and the other two are strings. If you'd like to give some hints to Data Factory of what uh, to use as defaults for certain data types, you can put them in here. So you can say that, you know, a date should be of this format. Um, uh, this is what my Boolean value is being used in my source data, so it can find Booleans and so on. 
Um, now that I have data types associated with it, if I go back to my data preview, you'll see that, um, if I could refresh this, you'll see that rating column is now going to be a number. So when you preview, when you profile that data in preview, the stats you're going to get back are going to be different because we were looking at categorical data. So we saw a breakdown of the value distributions. But if I click now on rating and I click um, statistics, I'll get a very different view of that data. And you can see that um, we have the different value distributions uh, through, for numeric data, which means I can tell how many were null, what's the 25th percentile, what is the 75th percentile, standard deviation, variance, min max. Okay? So you get all that uh, for you here in, um, in data preview and data factory. All right, let's get back to how to do the CDC part. So now that we have CDC enabled, let's, I'm not going to do transformation, but you can see all the different transformations that you can do with your data, the aggregates, pivots, drive columns, all the things that you'd probably do in something like an SSIS or Informatica, whatever it is, are all available to you here. To demonstrate the CDC, I'm just going to have a simple sync at the end. And the data set I'm going to use to land the data, I'm going to have a folder that is called folder CDC, folder out CDC. Oops, I didn't click it. There we go. Now, um, let me show you what that data set looks like. So the data set is very, very simple. Um, it's just a, a comma separated file. It's gonna be um, text limited output. And it's gonna go into the container in my ideal league store called output CDC. And I should have that open over here on my storage explorer and it is right here, output CDC. So we'll watch the data land in here as we run these pipelines. And that's pretty much it. Now I'm not specifying any file name for the um, outputs of that data. If I go back to the data flow, you'll see that in my sync, I'm not specifying a file name at all. Um, you can specify a file name here by saying um, output to single file, but I'm just gonna say, you know, I'm running Spark, I'm running at scale, Go ahead and, and you know do your thing, call the file name whatever you need it to, and it's gonna be much more fast and efficient. So what you're gonna see is we're gonna get file names that are gonna have GUIDs that are essentially the job executor number on the Spark cluster. And remember, I said this is that this output um, type is a CSV, and you can see that in the data set by saying that it is comma separated, comma limited. So it's gonna be a CSV file. Now, um, the other thing I want to say about that. Um, is that uh, we're also allowing schema drift. So I'm not specifying any column types. I'm not doing any field mapping, nothing at all. This is, this is it. This is all you have to do to make this work, okay? Because auto mapping and schema drift means whatever columns I find left-hand side, Data Factory will automatically produce that on the right-hand side, okay? Now, what else do we want to do with this? I think this is probably... Good enough at this point. Why don't we just do a data preview just to take a look at what the data will look like. You should see the exact same data coming out here. Um, at this point, when you're previewing data inside of Dataflow, uh, nothing is being written. Uh, this data is just taking a, a, a uh, uh, an image of essentially the in-memory data frames, a sampling of it, and giving it to you here in the UI. Um, and you can also export this to CSV, by the way, your view pane at the bottom, this whole data, you can export all that if you'd like to um, do a little bit of data exploration on it on your own through Excel or whatever tool. So that's pretty much it. Let's go ahead, let's go over to the pipeline now that's running this. I know what we can do. I just realized I didn't do this, is that um, we didn't give this a name, it's just called Dataflow 14. Let's give it a more meaningful name. Let's call it demo of um, CDC files. OK, very good. And I have to go all the way down here. Oops, give me a sec, I'm going to have to minimize this again. I do not have enough screen real estate here on my laptop, so just bear with me for a sec. Now let's say I saved it <laughs> without me needing to, so that's good. That was a nice little trick. Um, Good. It's called it's called demo of CDC files. That's great. Let's go back to the pipeline now. And there's the data flow activity. And you'll see the data flow activity is now called demo of CDC files. 
OK, so that's pretty much all we have to do. Um, now that we have um, all of that set up, we should be able to just run this. Remember on the source, we have sets. The buttons for CDC, we have enabled change data capture, and we have read all files at initial load. Now, I have my, like I said, I have my GitHub um, hooked up. You can use DevOps or GitHub. I have that hooked up so I can just save all this. I don't need to publish. Um, I can actually go ahead and debug this as is. So I go back to my um, CDC demo and I go ahead and run this in debug mode. This will use the debug cluster that is running here. And we'll execute this um, against that cluster. So it's going to go immediately. If you click on the eyeglasses, this is where you're going to get that detailed view of the monitoring that I was talking about um, previously. OK, so this is currently queued up for processing within the service. And it's done already, so it, it completed in just a couple of seconds. The 9000 rows are processed, so the entire thing was processed. That's the initial load, right? Now if we go back. To that same. Pipeline, and if we click on um, debug again, let me go ahead and refresh this. So end to end, it took 34 seconds. The data flow took a few seconds, but there's setup and tear down of the processes in between that takes a little bit longer, so it took 34 seconds. Now, if we click debug again, let's see what we get this time. So if everything's working right, we should get zero rows this time because we've already read that file. And there was nothing new that was added into um, that folder. So the job is queued up to run. And it's done in 24 seconds this time, which is probably because there were not any rows uh, written, right? So no rows were read or written. And so it's a fail fast kind of scenario. And so that's why it ran faster. So now I'm looking at that exact same folder with that same file in it, but Data Factory knows not to read any of this because uh, it's keeping a checkpoint for you. So I didn't do, that's all you had to do to uh, implement CDC with files. Now, CDC with files in Data Factory is a file-based operation, not a row-based operation. What I mean by that is that if I were to just change a value in here, like let's say I move this, um, let's say I move this year for the first record from 1975-1976, that's going to update that file. OK, but it's not going to only read that row. It's not going to be smart enough to do that. It is going to still process uh, that file because it has a new timestamp in it. So I just want you to be aware of how this works so that you understand that. Let's let that run for a second. And I do want to show you this too as well. So now that we've enabled CDC on this pipeline, you do get this checkpoint key. Um, and this is the GUID that is being used for maintaining the um, checkpoint for you. You can override this and you can parameterize it, in fact, as well. So you can use dynamic content in there. What that means is if I want to reset this, you can just go ahead and change that checkpoint to key to whatever key you'd like, and it'll reset that uh, from the beginning. So notice that it processed 9,000 rows, even though only one was modified. OK, so I want you to be aware of that. Now, a, a other another use case of this enables. Is in that same folder, if I were to do something like this, if I were to instead of modifying a file, if I were to upload or add another file, completely brand new one to uh, this folder. So I've done this demo a bunch of times, so you see all those files sitting there. That's exactly what I'm going to pull is my file called new movies or new movie. It only has one new movie in it. Let's go ahead and upload that and I'll show you the file real quick here. OK, and it has the same headers in one new file or one new row called my fake movie. So this will work a lot better because that's just going to process just that one because that file 
the file with the 9000 rows in it has already been processed and data factory knows that. So if I debug this. Then I look at the inspection of the uh, monitoring on this. Okay, it is completed. And it processed one additional row, 9,128 rows now are um, being processed by um, CDC. So what will happen is um, Data Factory will always know when a new file has come in and a file has been updated. And it'll be able to process those um, um, as they land without you needing to do anything else to your sources or to your pipeline. Um, Data Factory maintains all the checkpoints for you and all those um, and it's all completely maintained for you. In fact, another thing that you can do is in the monitoring view, if you go into your, um, your your triggered runs and you click on a pipeline with CDC enabled, if you click rerun, um, it'll also apply that CDC process to it as well. So if you rerun something but haven't added new files to it, it's going to process nothing. It'll only process files that have been landed since the time that that, re that that run executed. So keep that in mind too, is that the rerun is also smart enough to know about the checkpoint time on there. Mark, Mark. Uh, yes. What is happening, what is happening at, the, uh, at the target site? Is that uh, how many files oh. that has been generated? Yeah, yeah, great. I'm glad you brought that up because I promised to show you that and I didn't do that. So this is the target side here. And so every time we ran, we got a new file or set of files uh, that came out. Remember I said, I'm not renaming the file. I'm just letting the process keep the name of that file. And so it wrote a new file for every time. It's not going to write multiple files, just a file for every run. And that is based on the, that's really essentially based on um, partitioning of the data. If I had lots of rows, if I had tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of rows, you'd get multiple files because um, Spark would be partitioning that into multiple files. But for this, I got one run for, I got one file for every run. When there were no rows processed, of course, I got nothing. Does it mean the last time when you run? So like the small file who's got one record, the other one got like 9,000 something. Those two sure. together, it generated one file? Uh, this one actually produced two files, actually. Um, so this one was actually uh, producing two different files. And I think that that's more of a matter of um, the fact that it was probably um, partitioned that way. Um, uh, but it could be either way. You you can't necessarily you you can set that. There is a way to set that. But in most cases, you will just let Data Factory make the decision on how best to partition that. So over here in the sync, you can under optimize. You can set your own partitioning. So I could have said single partition, and everything would have gone to a single file. Um, I'm just using current partitioning, which means that Data Factory is going to uh, use the best practice of Spark for that partitioning, or you can manually set it. If I had actually set partitioning, I could even say something like um, do a round robin of um, 20 partitions. And that would split up the data into um, essentially 20 different files. Um, you know, it was about 466, what was it? 466, was it? Um, yeah, 466K would have been split up 20 times um, smaller files. So you can kind of dictate that uh, in your data factory settings. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we have time for another demo. I want to now walk you through how to do this in SQL. Now, SQL is a little bit different uh, within Data Factory today, and we're actually working on other CDC capabilities. Today, we call it incremental. And the reason for that is because um, what I'm going to show you is the current CDC capability is more based on a timestamp within your data. We are enabling it to work with the CDC features of SQL, and that's going to land really, really soon. That Synapse link for SQL, as mentioning earlier, uses this the SQL CDC capability. And so this uh, native CDC capability in Data Factory will also have that. For now, you're going to use the incremental capability. So if I make a new pipeline, I'm going to call this pipeline this time as um, SQL CDC. And 
And uh, let's see, let's um, add a data flow. And we'll say new. All right, and this one we'll call SQL. Good enough. OK, so this time we use a SQL source. Let's use I'll use my product. Uh, dimension table, uh, let's do Tim products table. I think should work. Let's see if I have a, yeah, I already have a projection on this one. So this is good. Uh, and then we'll just do the same thing. We'll just drop the data right into a sync. We're not going to transform. We'll put it in that same folder. Uh, so let's go with. Um, the CDC output, so this is going to be the same CSV output without named files. But on the source, let's go to source options and let's set enab enable incremental extract. And you're going to get that same capability of start from beginning, and we're going to do that because we haven't run it yet. But now I have to pick a date time uh, stamp on here because this is not using the uh, native um, CDC within um, SQL. It's using the incremental an incremental capability. The uh, which means we're not forcing you or uh, requiring you to have CDC enabled on SQL server for this to work, but we are going to be enabling that as an option um, as well going forward. I'm not sure if this is the right um, table that I want here. Let me see. Dim products table. No, I want dim products. Let me use a different one. So I should have a data set for products. It might be this one. Let's see. Let's see this data set is pointing to dim products. Yeah, this is the one I want. So dim products, enable incremental extract. The um, timestamp column I'm going to use is called last updated. And that's it. So pretty much the same thing. Let's go back to the new pipeline, which is right here. And everything is saved. That's good. And I can save it. You don't need to necessarily save it, but I'll just save it just for uh, just to be safe. Make sure everything, I don't lose things if something closes on me. And uh, we'll go ahead and debug. Now this is the first initial run, so this should bring all the rows back. If I look at my SSMS, uh, let's see. Let's see how many rows we have in here. We have 301 rows. Let's go into the monitoring for the data flow. Mark, can Mark, they can do like file to the database as a CDC? Uh, what was the question? Uh, from file to the database. Of course, table. yeah, certainly. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, you can absolutely do that. OK, so this completed and it, it did write all 301 rows because we had checked on their um, initial load, right? You read everything on initial load. So let's go back to the pipeline. We're not going to change anything again. We're just going to click debug again. You'll see that data factory maintaining this uh, checkpoint should now have this come back with zero rows red. So it, it'll make your processes much faster. So you're only getting change data um, this way. Now, once we enable the full CDC, the full fidelity CDC with the SQL CDC, you also get deletes in there, which is not going to work here because this is only going to be inserts and updates because it's using a timestamp. But you see how fast this one took only 18 seconds. It was a fail fast. Zero rows were found, so zero rows were written. So that worked. I'm just fine. Now, if I do something like in my database table, if I were to update, uh, let's see, I'm going to update uh, product ID 737 with the current timestamp. And it's that row right at the top. Now, if I go, oops, where did I click? I go back to my data factory. And if I click on debug this time. We should see one row this time. So as opposed to the file based where um, it's going to process an entire file. If something was updated, uh, but a new file lands, it's only an update. It's only going to read that file. So that's definitely very useful. 
if you're getting a lot of files with small amounts of data in it. With a database, it's going to be much more easier, much more effective because it's going to know at the row level that something was added and all it did was just wrote one row. So that makes it very, very simple to uh, create a very efficient um, ETL mechanism within Data Factory by using CDC. Now, if I look at what the results were, so let's have a look. So we got, uh, since I ran this, we got three files. So the first one looks like it had everything in it. Um, the second one had, it did write 236 bytes. Let me actually see if I can see what was in that one. The last one was 82 bytes. So one of these is going to have had, yeah, this was the one with the, the one row. I did say open. There it is. go. There we go. So there it was just the one row was written. OK, so um, um, in this case it was because each one each time I ran it was a individual separate. Um, execution of that pipeline, which is why you only got um, a separate file for every run uh, that happened. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's all you have to do. The other things I did want to quick just kind of make sure you saw um, before we just kind of open up for questions is we also had in here um, uh, in the slides I mentioned the ability to do things like the data replication. And so data replication is also using that same CDC capability and uh, that is just built into a slightly different orientation, which is in Synapse. In Synapse, there is a, let me actually go over to the screen over here, the Synapse. There is what's called Synapse Link. And so if you are in the, in the integrate section of the Synapse workspace, you can go to new link connection. And you can connect to your um, SQL server and your SQL database. Uh, yeah, I may not have the, uh, this one may not be set up. Uh, let's see if this one is. Yep, there we go. So there's all the tables found from my um, source database. Remember, this is data replication, so it's going to worry about things like primary keys um, are going to be necessary uh, for this. Um, primary key is required. Here's one that has it. So I can replicate that table. And I can say what SQL pool do I want to, um, do I want to land that data in? And then it's going to ask me some of the same questions that we have for data flows when you're building it from the design service, like how many cores do you want to apply to that job? OK, and then you can publish this and you can um, execute and activate this and now you'll get a, um, a Synapse link, which is essentially going to be uh, the execution of your um, uh, data replication between your SQL Server and Synapse then at that point. Uh, so I think I'm going to leave it right there um, that pretty much walk through the different new features around CDC. Uh, this is available for uh, Cosmos DB, um, Blob Story, DLS Gen 2, SQL, MySQL, Postgres, CDM. I might be missing one or two others. SAP, of course. Um, but yeah, so what questions do y'all have or what other things could I show you? Uh, we have a few minutes left. Any question you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hey, hi, uh, this is Arul. Uh, would you be able to provide us an example of using a power query? Uh, yeah, uh, I can share that. Sure, I can share that real quick. Yeah. Um, so um, power query. So I, I just kind of changing topics a little bit, but that's fine. Power query doesn't have the CDC capability built into it, but you, Power Query in ADF is really simple to use. Um, what you want to do is to get started is um, add an activity onto a pipeline. You can just add that into any pipeline. So if I just drag Power Query over here, I'll get that activity on my design surface. And the same thing with how I created a new data flow, I can just say new. And that'll put me into the Power Query interface. And so pick one of your data sets. Uh, we were working with movies. 
So let me pick that same one. Uh, movies D2. That's going to load into this uh, Power Query UI inside a data factory, embedded inside a data factory. Uh, and you'll be able to work with data uh, just like you do in Power Query. So you get a lot of the sort of things I was showing you in Dataflow here, like you get the ability to uh, profile the data and to transform the data. Um, this is all just working against uh, the cloud Power Query service. If you were to complete this, let's say I did something like, um, I don't know, let's say I changed the movie. Uh, let's say this, let's, let's uh, remove some values. Let's say we take out these IDs as one applied step. Then another one, let's change the data type. Let's make this into, um, let's make it to a whole number. Okay, so now I have these couple of steps inside my user query. Uh, when I save this, they didn't give it a name. It's just called uh, Power Query 7. I could have that run as a pipeline. So back in my pipeline here, oops, I'm moving around too much. I need my mouse and my monitor for this to work. Give me a sec. I'll, f I'll find it. There it is. When I execute this from a debug, um, next I can probably do it. I think that, oh yeah, one other thing. Um, when you get results, you'll want to put those results somewhere. So you add a sync data set into your Power Query activity. So you can have as many output destinations as you like within Data Factory when using Power Query. So I could add for that, for each different query inside of that, um, um, inside of that Power Query, I can add as many syncs as I'd like to it. So if I had other queries, if I were to, you know, clone this query and add another query in here, uh, I'd be able to have multiple outputs. Um, I could have two different queries. In fact, that same query could have multiple outputs as well. It's very, very useful. So uh, if I were to add another one on here, yeah, and my browser is just not able to keep up with me. Uh, but each one of these can be loaded into a, let me go, try it this way. Uh, I'll probably be able to do it like this. <laughs> On my little screen, this is not working too good. These can all be different outputs. And each one of those queries will go into in fact, the same query can go to multiple, multiple outputs. So when I run this, let me see if this works. This should work. Well, what will happen is because I've made a pipeline with um, disconnected activities, they will both run at the same time. They'll run in parallel. So you'll see them at the bottom there. That power query will actually get translated into a data factory data flow and will also run on Spark. So I don't know if you saw that or not, but on the settings for that activity, I can set how much compute I want to apply to that. So it's really powerful that so you can now run your Power Query M at scale on Spark, and we translate all that for you. So let me go to the output on here. Let's see what we're getting. Yes, yeah, so the data flow succeeded probably because I, since nothing was updated, right? There shouldn't be any rows. I think this was the, uh, that should be the SQL one. So if I look at the detail monitoring on that, um, 301 rows. I might have reset the the um, uh, the checkpoint on it. Let's see if the power query is running. The power query is done. And so the power query had a series of transformations, right? I was doing things like data types and things like that. That process, 9,109 rows. Remember, I took out some rows uh, from it. So that's how you use power query. That was a nice little side demo there. Thank you, Mark. Oh, you're welcome, of course. What else? Any question? You can unmute yourself and 
that's good. If not, you know, uh, yeah, I would like to, you know, give uh, many thanks to Mark for, you know, giving us the time and teaching us the CDC capabilities. It was really great. Yeah. Um, Hopefully you all found it, uh, you know, interesting. Uh, I did promise uh, some links. Actually, let me do that before we go. Um, so let me actually show you. Here, this should work just fine if I go to uh, YouTube. I will go to our channel. So let me click on. Data factory. What's that? Uh, so this is our our fact our um, channel. If you go to Azure Data Factory, uh, I have some videos on here for CDC. Um, look at the video list. There's about 120 or so videos on here. Um, they're all sort of you know under 10 minutes or so, uh, showing you very specific things. Um, you can follow along in the video, so you can pause and you can skip some things and all that. And then um, under tutorials on our documentation, that's where we have some walkthroughs that you can also do. So that is under Azure Data Factory documentation. And if you look under tutorials down here, I haven't added one yet for CDC, but um, I think what's because we just released a lot of these connectors. But I think it'd be a great idea for me to do that, and I should probably um, uh, work with some other PMs on our team and get that uh, get that updated. But a lot of the other abilities, like the transformations I was walking you through. Um, is documented here. The other areas, Data Factory, uh, have tutorials on it as well. So those are great ways for you to get started as well. Mark, would you mind to put this link in the chat? Yeah. Have yeah, a great. <laughs> do that. And if uh, there is, you know, any sort of documentation or the tutorials or videos that you need that's not described already, um, feel free to. Uh, Drop us a line in, in any of the social medias, the, the YouTube, uh, Twitter, we have a Twitter account or um, LinkedIn, catch me on LinkedIn and let me know what you need and happy to do it. Oh, that would be great. But um, yeah, and if you don't have any question anymore. Uh, thank you so much for joining everyone. And we'll have the next event in July. And thank you so much, Mark, again. Thank you for your time. Okay, we're going to say bye for today and have a nice evening. I don't know what is the time, Mark, though. Is it like? It's, uh, it? it's quarter after four, so I've got about uh, ah, two. Minutes. Okay, okay. <laughs> have a good night, everybody. Yeah. Okay, have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice one. Thank you. Thank you.